Good morning. I managed to fix the, uh, the start button on this camera. I'm very pleased. <laughs> Peter's vintage V100. I haven't seen a V100 for actually could be over a year or more maybe. Yeah, it's um the very nice guitars. I mean, just just do do it all really. Good old. Pickups, I think they do a really good job. Um, what's there to say about it? Well, yeah, Trevor Wilkinson inspired a design made by John Hornby Skews Distributors or Company. Um, and Wilkinson is the man behind the Fret King brands, the Encore brands, the vintage brands and I think there's something else as well but I forgot what it was anyway and just a perfectly fine all-round LP copy with you know a sort of safe design headstock so it doesn't run into lawsuit issues um, a little bit I mean for my liking a bit plasticky here but you know every, every guitar is a bit plasticky in this department this is loose actually um, plastic nut as standard by the looks of it. And in this case, um, a high action, high playing action, so we'll take care of that. But otherwise, um, yeah, nice machine. I mean, what's not to like? It looks like it wants to try and fall off my strap, so I'm just going to be very, very careful. all Wilkinson humbuckers it drives the old crunchy stuff really well um, I'm keeping it low because it's early morning ish slack is uh, still on the strings. So Peter, to make the point about um, tuning stability, I don't know, I'm just guessing now, but let's say... Make those two the same. Now let's stretch this one. That's how much slack there is in in the uh, in the A string, for example. So all of that slack still in those strings will come out when you're playing it, when you least expect it. The one thing I've not noticed about this, there doesn't seem to be any pinging on the nut slots, so that's good. Um, I mean, it doesn't. It means technically, it means we don't. We don't have to. Uh, aha! Evidence. We don't have to change it, but I can see evidence of graphite being chucked in there. So I'll change it for a bone one anyway, because we need to. Um, we need to get it running smoothly or cl cleanly without it needing the lubricant, basically. I mean, you can always chuck graphite in as a temporary fix but you don't want to be sort of relying on that all the time because it means the nut slots are too tight 
anyway so I'm just gonna get this sorry out of the way I mean remembering finally to unplug the power supply before I move this and stuff so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a look at the um, playing action by the way that's a, a plectrum made from the brass base plate of a P90 pickup I quite like the way it sounds actually. Um, okay. So here we have the vintage V100. There is a bolt-on neck version of this called the V99, which is um, which is also a, a pretty good guitar. Um, it's a lot of people pass it up because it's bolt-on neck and they believe the hype or the myth that says it's no good. But it's a uh, this issue. This myth about sustain—you only get sustain if you've got a glued-on neck. It's not true. It's just not true. <laughs> anyway, so let's just get the things we need. Um, while I was doing that, I was also doing a sort of a test to try and stain uh, a skunk stripe on Nick's neck, and I put some rosewood on there. Uh, to see if it will do anything. Actually, it needs to be lifted at one end. Um, but actually, it isn't really seeming to sink in because Wengi or Wenge or whatever people call it is pretty impenetrable to dyes. It's a very dense wood. Um, it's full of well, has oils and stuff in it. So anyway, um, so just looking at the thing, we got what I'm pretty certain is a. It's a plastic nut. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure, it's hard to tell. Um, it feels it feels plastic. Um, so we so anyway let's let's do some measuring, see what we've got. Now I kind of repeat this a million times. I don't know where this is actually looking, but the measuring for me is a, it's just a it's a reference point, okay? It's not an end, an end or a means to any. Sorry, no, it's a means to an end. It's not the end. So some people go get very obsessed about what are the specs for this guitar, or you know exactly how much neck relief should, shouldn't. And there's no actual answer to that. The, the issue of neck relief is a is a personal choice, um, preference. There are some limits, i.e., if you have no neck relief at all. Um, Let's put it to the three options. You have, you could have minus or negative relief, which is a hump, in which case your guitar won't play in the first half of the fingerboard because all the frets will choke in the, in the hump. Um, then you can have dead flat, in which case you basically have to have incredibly low, or sorry, incredibly level frets and or a low last fret, sorry, a higher last fret action to make it play because the strings got nowhere to spin if you have a very flat neck so uh, you can get away with it on guitars um, with very flexible or adjustable necks with um, for example SG's and um, Ibanez modern Ibanez's for example you can get a very flat playing with a, a nice low action because you can fret level them into a point where they play but if you hit them hard they'll still clatter on the frets or well, the alternative is you have um, some curvature. <laughs> I can't do it with my hand. Some curvature in the neck, some co concavity, which is technically ideal. You want a little bit so that the strings can swing around, near, theoretically near the part where they move the most. But of course, you, if you've got half a brain, you can see that the point at which the string will move at its maximum amount is here, around about 12 fret, which also because that's halfway along the string and it's going to swing. I use the skipping rope analogy and it swings more in the center or the you know, playing jump rope thing. When two people swing a rope, you see it makes a big arc, a big circle in the center. So that's approximately there, which also happens to coincide <coughs> not with the center of the fingerboard, which is there, or the center of the truss rod, which is there, but also you notice that the neck starts to thicken up from from the dead center of the string movement, the point of most movement, the neck is thickening. Um, not only is it thickening, it's also then from there onwards, it's locked into the body with, by being glued to the slab of mahogany. So um, <coughs> he 
you can see that it's an imperfect uh, situation anyway. Um, and so the whole thing is non, the whole thing is clearly non-scientific. And I actually made a guitar the last year, which is hanging up over there, in which the whole neck, it's a bass neck, which I converted to a six string. So the whole truss rod run, runs from the nut to the bridge, or from, from close to the nut to the bridge. And the sides here are not connected to the body, they only connect from here onwards, which means the whole neck, entire neck can curve. Um, which is pretty odd. Nobody, it's, a, it's a solution to a, to a non-problem really because people have been playing rock and roll on guitars like this for years and doing a great job of it. But just for those technical geeks it's quite funny to think that the the centre of the truss rod is, is here, the actual centre of the bendable part of the truss rod is here and the string centre is here so the point of most movement is way off the point of curvature in the neck allowing clearance so it's a it's a best guess as far as manufacturers are concerned or as far as the electric guitar is concerned it's a fudge anyway but the point is <clears throat> why does it matter because it matters when you're holding down the first and last fret some people insist because of this relative straightness of this part some people insist you hold down on the I don't know well, I can't remember what they say maybe this 17th or something where it joins the body and they go hold it down from there to there and check the neck relief right and I'm looking at barely a tenth of a mil hold it from there looks a tiny bit more or I don't know maybe it doesn't I don't I always check from here to here it seems to work fine and that's because I'm not aiming for a figure um, when I evaluate it the first thing that I, my eyes tell me is in the dead center point is there any clearance well yes I can see a gap I can see it pressing in and the next question is how much of a clearance is that? Is it half a millimetre? Is it a millimetre? And I'd say it's about actually about 0.2. Right? That's perfectly enough for my liking. You can set more if you prefer it that way and you hit the strings really hard. Uh, or if you're trying to go lower action or you can't level your frets or whatever. Um, but 0.2 is a perfectly good start point. And I always say to people, don't pick something and aim for a number and then leave it at that. It's far better to experiment and see what the difference actually feels like and get a sense. And I can tell you from experience that a small um, adjustment in relief can make an incredibly big difference to how the guitar feels to play. So it really is important. Um, now that is because it raises the action around this part of the guitar more than anywhere else. Um, but despite doing that, you've got to get through your head that using the truss rod adjuster to change the action is not the principal way of doing it so you hear people in forums say um, I've got a problem with my guitar action and people go oh yes well t tweak your truss rod and this and that and the other and technically it's true that the secondary effect of tweaking your truss rod is to create a different playing action focused around the middle part the, the neck where it bends most but it's like consider it I, I recommend thinking of it as a secondary um, uh, benefit or a secondary effect the primary effect for, for adjusting your truss rod to some shape or other is to give it just enough curvature to allow your strings when set at a low playing action to vibrate and spin without clattering. Now there is a limit in action if you take this action right down to 1.5 millimeters max at the last fret um, you always run the risk of if you hit it really hard you will get some clatter. A benefit of it being set this high is you can you can hit it with a hammer practically and it doesn't clatter anywhere down there. Now, if, you, if we change this immediately down pound for pound, which I'll do anyway, if we take this down, um, what you'll find, uh, if I can get the right screwdriver, what you'll find is that it, um, it will start clattering if we hit it. That's clattering on the frets there. Even though it's got about three millimeter action. At the last fret so it's just basic simple physics if you hit the strings really hard you can you may be able to see just how much that's vibrating um, that has to go somewhere if there's frets in the way it's going to hit them and it, it'll hit them faster if the action is much lower when you hit it like that now people don't want a massively high action usually because it feels pretty hard to play up here although some people have have learned to play on very high actions come to like it and wouldn't have it any other way and it's a personal thing 
um, benefit they get is they can hit the strings really hard and it never, almost never, barely ever clatters on the strings. Now, interestingly, that zzz, um, doesn't really, in my experience, doesn't really, you don't hear that through the amp um, because really you're hearing only the movement of the string through the magnet, uh, through the magnetic field. Anyway, so what have we got? Three things that make up your action. The neck relief, which we check first. Um, I'm not going to adjust this because it feels just about right. Then we check the, um, the the two actions. And now these three things, the neck relief, the first fret action, and the, uh, and the last fret action. The first fret action is adjusted by the nut slots, how deep you cut them. And the last fret action here is adjusted by um, where you set the bridge or the saddles if it's a strap. Um, those three things, the neck relief, the curvature of the neck, the first fret action and the last fret action are all interrelated so that if I measure the first fret action here and then I go and lower this bridge considerably by two, two and a half millimeters or something, then of course that will come down as well. You just need to know that. You can't, you can't there isn't a mathematical formula, it probably is, mathematical formula you could write it down and go well if I want the x, x I have to make y there and z there and so on you could probably put that into some algorithm I can't be bothered what I know is a sequence of first of all setting the neck relief independent of everything else in a sense the neck relief is a little bit independent actually I could say because it's it's um, what changes the neck relief is the amount of tension on the truss rod um, but outside of that the only other thing that impacts it is the well obviously the things like the strength of the wood and all that but in any on any day the thing that governs it is the uh, tension of the string so whether you tune it up down or add thicker strings but given the strings that are on there this neck is going to stay in that shape unless I tune it up two octaves or something in which case it's going to heavily load the neck snap the strings probably and bend the neck into a more of a curve but so so the three of the three variables in your playing action, your primary variables, the neck relief, first fret action, last fret action. The neck relief I check first because in a way it stays the same so long as you don't over tighten the strings or change the gauge. Another way of saying that is adjusting the, the action at the first and the last fret doesn't affect in any way, does has no effect in any way on the um, amount of relief in the neck. So I start with that and I go, is there point 0.1 to point 0.2, somewhere like that? Yes, it's good. It's not too high, it's not too little. Then I look at the first fret action and I say to myself, with this current high action, or well, actually I look at both of these and I go, which of these is most immediately out? And the, this doesn't look too bad up here, but this is way out here. So for the kind of actions that I know people want, I might as well bring, if something needs altering, I might as well bring the obviously high thing down. Now this is running at three millimeters, so it's a millimeter and a half higher than most of my customers ever want it to be. So I'm going to dial that right in, okay, and and then I need to do it a bit on both sides. But there's a lot of dialing in to do because it's very very high. So dialing it in by turning it counter uh, clockwise to to reduce the height. Here we have one point. Three-ish, and here we have still bang, over two. So we've got quite a lot of room. You saw how much I've already turned it. That's a load of adjustment. Now, actually, interestingly, we're now down at its lowest point. We're on the stops, which I always find interesting in these set neck guitars, and that is on the stops at one point one point five millimeters, which is my preferred action. Now, the first thing you'll hear. Probably more um, hitting of the frets, slapping of the frets. Not, not a lot more, but probably a little bit more than we had before, but this is not bad. Now obviously we're now detuned, and I need to borrow a string from somewhere. I can't be bothered to plug the darned what's it in again, so let me borrow a left-handed A. I've got a tuner up here. So that was just a quick way of getting back to tune.
Now as I'm doing this, I'm listening to the for any pings of the strings going through the nut. And because it's lubricated, it works well. Not bad, not bad at all. Um, got a little bit of sort of little bit of deadening going on up there. So this area here would benefit from fret leveling. Now, um, at this point, what I'd normally do is turn my attention to I like this magic arm it's very clever um, at this point I'd normally turn my attention to uh, the nut slots and I'm half I'm in two minds here this is it's almost certainly plastic and, uh, but it, and it's and it's got quite a bit of um, it's using quite a bit of uh, graphite to keep it uh, in order Keep it running smoothly and I'm sort of tempted to leave it because it's not pinging and it is working however part of the setup involves the cost or the benefit of the setup is having a, a, a bone nut replacement and I think it's probably worth doing for this um, it's a better sonic a tra better transfer of energy into the guitar bit denser so it has a slight benefit in terms of tone um, so what I'm going to do before I do any more adjustments so the point is uh, having reduced the bridge to a, a level that is my target action which is actually can't go any lower on the bass side but that's as low as I want to go um, what I can look now and see is that the action of the first fret is pretty good um, it's unusually good um, however it still doesn't change the fact that part of the thing here is to replace it unless it unless I'm mistaken and this is some sort of new bone or tusk um, the, re the thing about that is that if it even if it is um, I can still improve the movement of the strings by just widening these slots a bit so there's absolutely no there's no harm in removing it and examining it and putting it back on if, if necessary and uh, and once once back on um, we can set the, uh, the A action so that it's um, set the slots so that they don't don't not only don't grip but they don't require um, graphite all the time. Now th this one here is trying to it's kind of hooking up a little bit on the um, on the lacquer. So this okay that's fine. Yeah, the lacquer sort of runs right up to the nut and it's trying to pull. He wants to pull the whole lip, lip of lacquer. So this hasn't been changed, so it either came with um, this, well, it came with this nut on, basically. I'm just trying to disconnect it from the gloopy bit of paint on the other side. It's quite, quite common. You find the same thing with a lot of Harley Bentons, actually, is that they, they, um, yeah, they must do the, the lacquer after the clear coat or something, or paint layer or something like that after they've put the nut on because you get the paint running up the side like a blanket um, and it makes it very difficult to do what I'm trying to do now, which is remove the nut. Um, Plastic 
plastic. Yeah, so anyway, that got that out without too much trouble. But like I say, there's a definite curly lip, a buildup of um, paint on the other side. And the danger is if you, if you just bash in a straight line that way, the nut will come off, but you, you run the risk of, I mean, that, that paint layer was moving already. You could feel it um, and it will do that. But if you hit too hard, you'll take it off and you'll snap it. So while you're there, Kind of makes sense to just give give the uh, the edges a little bit of a clean up. But you're going to want to put a new nut on there and want it, want it to sit as flat as <coughs> as possible. There's a bit of excess timber hanging off here. That's good. So we have our bone nut. Right, you you are like so much like at the wrong end of the, the proceedings here with the camera. I'm sorry about that. I haven't thought this through, obviously. Right, that's not quite fitting. So again, I don't want to have to stress this paintwork. Um, I don't ever think I should. I should device somewhere you can be I can't really do this left-handed I suppose what I could do is bring out some old technology for a moment <coughs> gives a bit of variety old tech, old tech. go for a travel you sort of leap from velcro thing to velcro thing I hope you don't mind too much there you go better view better view okay so there um, we have it. Uh, so what I'd do with this is just move that to one side for a minute. So it's always invaluable, I find, to have a sanding board ready because for things like this, all I want to do is just take off a bit of the thickness of this <clears throat> with a view to dropping it back in there uh, with so it fits right down to the bottom, which it now does perfectly. Okay, now you may find a, a nut will stick out just a tiny little bit, and I prefer to take care of that once we've put it in place. Now the other thing that's still a mystery to me is this thing about nut heights. Now this one is clearly, um, I haven't worked a way of doing this, right? So what I tend to do so I tend to fix the nut in place and then work downwards through the slots, through the medium of the slots. Uh, it's quite time consuming. The longer I'm spent cutting the slots, the more time it takes, basically. That's <laughs> a bit logical. Tautological. Um, so it would be wonderful if we could just cut it to the right height, exact height as this, um, and then drop it in and, and look, we use the original slots and everything we don't even have to cut anything that would be wonderful but my experience is no matter how many times I've done this I simply cannot get it to the right dimension now you'd think if somebody was had half a brain they could do this this way okay and they, you'd say right what's the distance between the the bottom of the thing there and the base we go 6.83 let's write it down for fun so we draw our thing we go base it's not a B even. We go travel. We go, what did we say? 6.83 6 between the high E and the ground. And then we go. Six point six nine between the low E and the ground. Now theoretically, if I had any skill at all, I'd be able to do the same thing here. I just find this really unreliable. I put this in the slot here, which is barely a slot, and I go, hey, it's 8.01. Right? And then I go down to the base end. <clears throat> I put that in the bottom of the slot there, and I bring that into there, and I go, hey, it's 7.64. I'm going to do some simple mathematics, right? Shall I use my phone for this? Uh, no, I should be able to do this in maths. 7.64 multiplied by 
minus 6.69. 9 from 4 is nothing, uh, for 9 from 14 is uh, 5. Uh, 6 from 5, is, you can't do it, so that goes to 6. That goes 6 from 15 is 9. Six from six from six. That's 0.95 difference. That makes about right, doesn't it? Uh, mm, yeah. So, uh, which one am I looking at? Okay, so um, the current one is I need to take off point, not point 0.95 of a millimetre to make it the same. The other one, we have 8.01 and 6.83. 3 from 11 is 8. Oh hell, I'm in the zero now. That's already a nine. Eight, for, but that's a, that's a seven. <laughs> eight from nine is one. Six from seven is one. One point one eight. Does that sound about right? Seven nine eight. Yeah, that's exactly right. My maths. So minus one point one eight. So that's an interesting thing. If only I was clever enough to remove one point one eight from this end and even mark it. So look, I've got a 0.1 millimeter thin. This is gonna, I'm gonna waste yet another, no I'm not, this is gonna be successful. So let's be conservative, shall we? Let's not even go to 0.18, let's go to, sorry, 1.18, let's go to one. Let's call it one millimeter. And now here comes the crude bit, let's line up that and might make our one milli millimeter mark millimeter mark one millimeter mark and now let's do nine five no let's not do nine five let's do seven five just to be on the safe side from the base end and we line that up sort of but you don't bet they don't look hardly any different okay now I know that there's a bit of a gradient, right? Yeah, what a bit of a curve. It's not a big one, and it's not really playing ball because it's on a bit of a slope anyway. Yeah. So I've drawn a line, but actually I noticed that line technically looks a bit overcut. So I could tell myself, okay, no worries, don't panic, cut. And leave a bit of black line showing. You can do it, you can do it. So I colour this in for my own visual reference, which is actually a bit imprecise. Then, <laughs> here I go, here I go. So which end is going to be cutting more? The trebly end. So what I'm going to do, take it, keep it flat, I'm going to try and cut some more at the treble end than any other end and I'm kind of hoping to balance that up that way and that's just by varying the pressure where I'm pushing it down and hopefully if I can get it sort of to the same mark then I'll be able to straighten up and continue all the way. And I'm doing my little sanding dance you'll notice which is trying to move me and the piece more than I move my hands. <laughs> so I keep it as nicely flat the whole time as possible and I like to sway in my shed. Now what's happening? It's looking good. It's looking good. Now I've never succeeded in this. If this works, this will be the very first time ever. And I will be mighty pleased with my handiwork. Still a bit heavier on the base end. Now I should be leveling it off. Again, checking that we've got a flat bottom nut to make this rocking world go round. And I'm easing off the pressure because I'm just concentrating more on the right angle here. I think I'm on the mark, on the mark with that end now. We're in a 
interesting scenario. I think we're that's where we're going to be. I just need to make sure now that it's flat. That's the main thing. Ah, that's as good as I can go. Let's try this. Oh boy, this is going to be fun. Now, technically speaking, I should just be able to see that's just nonsense. <laughs> I drop that in, and according to my calculations, that should have solved the problem there and then. Hmm, it's still a way off. Let's, uh, let's see how far off. Because if it is, then I do declare that I have no idea why this never works out as measured. So let's put it under. Is that that far off? It's bloody miles high. Now, what happens is, at this point, I go, right, I'm going to have another go at it. And I look at that, and that's just way too high, baby. Um, almost touched the sky. Uh, hmm. Well, we're not far off, actually. It's a bit, I'm, There's no way I'm going to get this without doing any sanding. So I could now, what, I, what I'm going to now do, just for fun, is I'm going to give it a little bit more uh, bottom sanding, a tiny bit more, and then hope that I get, now this is where it gets completely um, guessworky. And I'm now going to hope to get to where I need to go. According to this, all sides of it need to come down evenly. And now I'm working a random amount. Okay, now there I'm going to stop. And if that isn't overcut already, <laughs> then I'll be amazed because it usually is by this point. So I can just load it up again, making sure, making sure it's sitting down in the slot properly. And we'll probably be very close now to ideal height. Um, there's another way of looking at it. If, uh, I haven't got any, uh, I do have some very, very thin copper shim material, which is quite cool. I sometimes used to use layers of copper tape, or I've got silver tape, which does the same thing. It sort of increases the height at a, at a fairly <coughs> a slow rate, but a, you know, a nice metallic, easily compressed rate. So it's quite a good way of doing it. Um, in fact, the silver stuff, would probably, the silver tape I've got probably work better as a visual on a guitar like this than um, copper. Anyway, that's actually not bad. It's one of the closest, but it still needs some adjustment. So, um, I've just made something disappear. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to glue this nut lightly in place. <coughs> um, but before I do, I'm just going to get, sorry, I'm backtracking. I'm going to get a sense of, quickly get a sense of where the strings sit. So I know there's going to be a bit of overhang, and I want to know where it where it lives, ideally, which end. Okay, so getting the positioning of the yeah, it, it's better that any overhang is on the base side because that's about spot on. Okay, in fact, well, I can't leave it there because I've got to get it up. You can, you don't need glue technically. Um, but I do put a bit in just so that when an owner comes to change strings later on, it doesn't just fall out and surprise them because then they, they can panic a bit. Okay. So once I've glued this in place, the next step is to um, 
is to just work the nut slots down to the, the correct height and that's a precision operation really so we're at that point we're aiming to um, get the first fret action come on fingers to exactly where we want it okay that is where I want it a little bit of overhang on the base side that we can take off with the Dremel and then we claimed just a little bit of real estate as they call it on this side so that feels just a tiny bit under cut but it's in the correct place I don't want the string the E string any further towards the outside than that okay so then I can tune this up put some tension on it and I go from the middle out so it holds the nut in place and doesn't doesn't try and um, rip it to one side so I'm just balancing the well, I was going the right way it would balancing the strings as I tighten them Shall I use my little tune? Do you know what? Do you Actually, that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Not far off, actually. I'll, I'll tweak it now, fine-tune it. Um, but it isn't far off being perfect. Yeah. So maybe that's the way to do it. Measuring with the... Taking a kind of snapshot. All right, I learned something. So, we're still... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we're still higher than I would normally <coughs> be. But I've got a mixture of useful tools here to help me do the job. One of which is my trusty thing and a bunch of nut files. So I'm going to start by working outwards. I'm starting the the, uh, the D. That's pretty close actually. So with the D, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm just going to um, just fractionally open up the slot <coughs> to make sure that nothing will get grabbing and sticking then I use the the correct file now if you've seen me do this before you'll know that I use an oversized set in other words I'm using a 32 file when in fact this is probably the string gauge probably in 27 or something <coughs> I go above the gauge for the simple reason that I want to get free flowing, free moving strings. And so I'm using a combination of the two approaches. You could just use the uh, diamond coated jeweler's file, um, which I show how to do in my ebook actually. It's a very low cost method. <coughs> A set of these files cost about 50 quid um, and they are to be honest good but they're not absolutely re uh, required so I'm just working my way back to you girl with a burning love oh, sorry another one of those songs <laughs> giving away my age somebody in my age group will know that song um, wasn't there a shoveling motion involved in that tune? Cause I'm walking my way back to you, girl. Drifters, searchers, I can't remember. Us. Okay, so we're getting a, a deeper slot. Just about where I want to get the string down to the 0.3 of a millimetre, which is my... 
target action. Change the server for the next one in the sequence. 42. Measure it. Assess the gap. See there is a gap. There is indeed a gap. Cut some using the file. Kind of it's a use it for shoveling away masses masses of material really. Now ultimately I'm trying to cut a backward slope. It doesn't really matter whether the slope is curved or just a straight line. As long as it's not steeper than the actual angle of the strings going to the tuner, then it will work. That's the sort of guide really. And its purpose is to make sure the string comes upwards, up across the back of the nut and launches cleanly off the front edge. That's the, that's the idea. Now the old thing about measurements and numbers, people might say, what's the angle? Well, you go, there's horizontal, there's a bit of an angle. There you go. And it doesn't really matter if they're all at a slightly different angle, so long as they all tilt backwards towards the tuners at not too extreme an angle, or an angle less than the actual strings are traveling backwards. No, not less, not, it can't be le less than. Yeah, well, even if it is, it just it doesn't really matter. Actually. If it is less than, then all that happens is that the uh, string will come straight up and launch off the very front part of the nut, which actually technically is what you want it to do. <sighs> so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does want to be a greater angle, technically speaking. But what what's important is that the front edge of the nut has to be capable of holding the string or launching the string at, over the first fret at this given height, or, yeah, this, this measured height that we're aiming for here, which happens to be about 0.3 of a millimetre, between 0.3 and 0.4. And it takes a little bit of careful time to get there. And there's still fresh air between the two, so you can keep going a little bit, but it is a, you know, it's a careful, delicate operation and the straighter and cleaner it is, the better. I'll stop with that one. Switch to the last one on the base side. So you can see that even with having worked the underside of the nut, all that's done for me really is saved me a bit of time here, meaning I don't have to dig dig quite as far down. Um, but you still really have to put in the, the, the time to get the first fret action right the way you want it. Quite a bit of working down you've got to do. And how much it cuts as you're going along is a combination of <coughs> constant measuring but also some degree of instinct and experience because you sort of have to know if and when you're about to overcut how much you can take. And occasionally, oh, you'll get it wrong, I do, and you have to start again if you get it wrong. But if you approach it in the same sort of careful sort of pace, then uh, usually you can get where you want to go without any big issues. You find that the thicker the, uh, the string, when you're down in the low E's and A's, the longer it takes to cut because you are moving quite a lot of bone material. 
It's also quite hard on the fine on the edge fret of the edge string. It's quite hard to gauge the playing action. I always have a tendency to wimp out too soon <coughs> when in fact you need to be keeping going until you get where, where you want to get. I'm building up a fair bit of dust here which we can clean up once we've finished this part of it. So we're only on an early stage here, which is, I'm going to leave that where it is. Um, we're on an early stage, we've still got <coughs> fret, fret leveling to go. But I was, it, in a way it always surprises me because, not surprises me, but I, I kind of, you get stuck in, in this method or this, this sequence of events, you get stuck in, I get stuck in, and then I kind of, I think of what's ahead, like fret leveling, Oh, and then there's all the, but actually what's true about this is once you've done the fret leveling, all that remains is sort of labor. You've, you've got to work the, um, you've got to polish the frets, clean up the guitar, and then restring it. And once you restring it, there's a bit of um, stretching, setting of the intonation. Um, when you've done that, you're home and dry because this even though it looks a little bit sort of brutal this is the precision we're in the precision stage right now making the the first fret action making the, the last fret the first fret action and next after this the uh, get it getting the level, frets level to work with this action that's the real precision stuff and once we've done that it's actually Pretty straightforward after that. Okay, we're on to the B. So despite having put in time and effort to get this right in the first place, this has still required some work on these slots and basically I found that in order to get the kind of action I want it's always required work like this on the top down it's about the only way you're going to get to the exact place you want to go there's virtually no way I've ever found of getting this precision from from the ground up from the bottom of the, uh, the nut which is, which is a shame in one way, but right, we're on the ball there. Now, at this point in the game, these strings that are on here originally, they're currently now being used as what I call sacrificial strings. So their purpose is just to set these various actions, and including doing the fret leveling, they'll play a role in that. Um, but I, you know, each time you move them, there is obviously a degree of stressing them. So I wouldn't want to call these the you know the customers playing strings. I would much rather um, plan, and as I do, plan to ditch these as soon as I've got the guitar set up, and then we go with fresh strings right there from the from the off. Now it's not it's not that you couldn't play with these strings but pulling them on and off is is adding some amount of stress or stressing the strings a little bit <coughs> <coughs> so the less stress they are when you hand them over to the customer the better okay I'm on the mark there too so that is the precision setting of the first fret action you see the bone dust built up there
lovely. Okay, <clears throat> now we move on to the next stage, which, for which we once again remove the strings, adding again more stress to them, more likely to break uh, uh, now than any other point in the proceedings because they're, they're getting repeatedly taken off and put back on. <coughs> and so now what I'm going to do is to mark up the frets for fret leveling. Now it's interesting I watched, um, I watched, I don't often watch other people's methods anymore and it's not arrogance it's just once you found something that works for you you have to kind of gauge how much time you spend spend re-researching re things that work <coughs> are working well um, but I had a look at this particular video and um, I, I noticed the, the guy leveled frets with a file I think he was doing it um, for a very honourable in a very honourable commendable fashion doing it with cheap tools and so on <clears throat> and he uh, he did it he did the leveling with a with a normal width file with the handle taken off and um, <clears throat> and he got uh, just scrape that up and down. And um, interestingly, sorry, I'll get there. Interestingly, he, he scraped this file up and down, so it was a bit like, dare not do it even, but, well, standard big file, scraped it up and down, his marked up frets, had the neck, neck the strings off, neck set straight, and um, when he'd done it, he'd taken some metal off all the frets, so they're all <clears throat> cut, and he put his fret rocker on, and you could hear um, uneven frets. Now, that doesn't mean they would necessarily interfere with play, because it, it only interferes if the, if the height of action he'd chosen um, was kind of low at that level where that unevenness m made a difference. But <clears throat> it's interesting that he stopped <clears throat> he stopped having taken an unknown amount of material off um, and stopped and left an unknown amount of unevenness in the. Uh, in the mix and then basically polished it all out set it up and played and I was just kind of just really curious to well not curious I, I was it reminded me of, <coughs> of what I like about this method <coughs> and why I use it and that this method just um, only takes off as much metal as is required to make the action you've chosen play well um, and it's a known, well, it's a known quantity. You stop when you, when your chosen action plays, <clears throat> and you don't continue, and you don't take off any more metal than is strictly necessary to make your, um, make your action cho uh, that you've chosen play. Now, as you saw from before, we've already chosen the action. <clears throat> in the fact that we've set the relief, we have set the last right action, and we've now set the first fret action. So we've got our chosen playing action and my job now is to make this, make the frets comply with that. Now I'm just at the point now where I'm noticing that this truss rod is slightly different from my other ones and it, it's only barely able to get to the, it, it doesn't quite go flat so it has a minimum curvature and sometimes when the fingerboard is very flat I have to use the other one but this is just at the mark so I can use this one. Um, so what I do is, having copied the curve of the fingerboard or the fretboard, my job is now to just gently work the file up and down over the neck for a little bit, mostly using gravity and the power of the 400 grit. <coughs> 
paper and then I stop and see what's what's happening. Well as expected we've got the 14th fret it's got quite high spots and um, we've got a couple in the middle here so it's all and, and some down here so it's kind of cutting and right up here on 20, 20, 20th fret so it's cutting and all the way along in different places but it's clearly taking down some high spots which some of which we could certainly feel already <coughs> just when we were playing those notes earlier on so now the beauty of my system here it's not my system but the beauty of this system is because it's all in playing mode I can now put the string back in that 14th fret is still a fraction too high for my liking it's still it's still actually completely playable now um, but I'm going to do a little fraction more on that 14th fret obviously I'm going to do all the other frets at the same time but I'm just sort of focusing my attention really on that on that 14th fret which is just getting in the way of the others so I'm just giving a bit more of a kicking with the file and you can see it's taking quite a bit off there as it should that's the high the interfering high spot and that's what's getting would would have been getting between this guitar and a decent action or a good low action I should say right having done that first one I use the same calibration on the tool for the second um, thing. The other thing you'll notice straight away is compared to a, even a, a, a standard file for cutting frets this is a, a lot more gentle but also it's a lot narrower so it's only it's not cutting very big flat spots uh, into the into the radius so it's much more respectful of the actual guitar radius than the uh, traditional file method. So I'm seeing another hot spot here, high spot there and there actually, there, 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 there. Again, no, not basically what, what I could tell from playing it. It's pretty good. Now I'm going to recalibrate for the next track, as I call it, the G track. to make sure that the radius hasn't changed and in fact it has the tiniest bit so I'm going to just recalibrate until I get it exactly and the amount of adjustment I'm making is minuscule but it's enough to register that I've got the right curve a little bit of cracking on the front edge of this nut actually flaking but it's not a problem still true so all the time using this tool you're kind of picking up feedback from the tool and from the thing uh, from the frets about what the underlying condition is and what's going on <clears throat> and what happens is if something untoward seems to happen like I'm not something I'm not expecting um, I stop and recalibrate. Not bad for incredibly low action. Move to the D channel, G slot, D track. Cancel out a tiny bit. ebook details how to use this it's not at all rocket science it's very elegant and very simple but it takes a, it takes some practice but you you can do it successfully from day one all that happens with practice is you just get more confident quicker and I think probably spend less time worrying about am I going wrong once you've done it a few times you really do 
get a feel of how this process works and why it works. Um, although, you know, like most people when I first heard of it, um, I was skeptical, thinking I couldn't get my, it's one of those conceptual things, I just couldn't get my head around. How do you level frets? When the next bent or curved doesn't make any sense. I think it was, it became, it was like a, a you know, a, flat, a bulb, light bulb going off when I realized that, well, the next bent, but of course, so is the tool. And that's the beauty of it. And then the inquiring mind goes, well, what's the, what, why, what, why does the neck have to be bent? And the bit that, that isn't obvious, but is, does make a lot of sense the more, the more you do it, the more you see how it works, is that leveling frets with the neck off and passively flattened is, I would say, let's say it achieves 100% accuracy for argument's sake at the point where you level the frets. That's great. And then you put the strings back on and you put the neck under tension. Put the neck under tension. Um, and as soon as you put the neck under tension, you're introducing a compression into the neck. And that force with the strings compressing the neck, not only does it cause it to bend, but it pushes it that way. And that, that little bit of, or that compression, has a slight effect on where the frets sit. And so your 100% accurate that you've got with your conventional fret leveling method that is then reduced somewhat. Now it's not a huge amount. And it's, it's, it wouldn't on its own, I would say, be enough to change a method for, and I don't, I'm not critical of that method, the, the, the passively leveled neck method, because I used it and it, it's made a massive difference and it's perfectly good. Um, the two main reasons I use this method are, first of all, because it, because its strings are on, it's in the playing position, I just level until Is that hitting a pickup? Okay, we've got a last fret here that's high. Um, yeah, so so first reason is it's 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 more ac um, it's it's more preserving of fret metal because I only level until I get the action I want to play, and then the. Uh, the second part is, as it happens, because you're doing it curved with the strings on, um, it's more accurate, slightly more accurate, because it includes the compression effects. Okay, I've paid a bit more attention to that end. We have got a couple of high frets right there at the end. Done rescued. Okay, so having done that, we can now take off the strings, the sacrificial strings, and either store them for another similar setup, which is never a bad thing to do. Just takes a little bit of time straightening them out and labeling them and hanging them somewhere that they don't get in the way. So I'll probably do off camera to save you the misery. Um, ouch. And then we're going to clean up the uh, fingerboard of dust. And before we get into the polishing stage, then we're to come, the next stage right now will be to reprofile the frets. So, <coughs> just pull this off for a second. Wow, that's stiff. Maybe I won't pull it off. Um, I'll do this while this is off to one side. Um, yeah, reprofiling the frets. So we've put some flat spots on these frets. So we mark them up again with the marker pen, and this time we're going to use a Stumac fret crowning file to scrape off or file off the shoulders of these flat spots with the idea of returning them to uh, a nice arch-shaped structure. Um, 
I saw a, an argument in some Luthia forum the other day where some so-called experts were, or well, resident experts, were ridiculing uh, what sounded like a fairly experienced tech who was coming on to say, you do need to re-crown, or you do need to crown your frets after leveling, because if, if, particularly if there's a quite a considerable flat spot, um, not not re-profiling uh, them causes the intonation point, for better of a want of a better term, to wander closer towards the uh, bridge than it should be, and having it as a nice curve brings that point back to the top of the curve. Now it's completely logical and having done this so many times I can see physically that is absolutely the case but the heroes in the forum knew better and ridiculed the guy in such a way that he would no doubt have left the forum completely and never come back because they were absolutely obnoxious in their certainty and uh, I, to be honest part of me wanted to post I'm not a member of it anyway but I was you know tempted to post in support of his view um, but it is it's a hiding to nothing you just find yourself being slagged by those who are so certain of their knowledge um, that it's just not worth it so hopefully that chap left and didn't go back and left them to it but it's absolutely completely and utterly logically obvious that when you um, when you introduce a flat spot that it has the effect of moving the point of intonation of the fret forward towards the bridge and if you do that and don't do anything about it it will make a tiny difference um, if it's very flat and you've taken a lot of material off it'll make more of a difference and you know for for people who spend their lives arguing about whether you know mahogany somehow miraculously changes the tone of uh, going through a pickup or coming out of a pickup versus bubinga or you know pao ferro or or i don't know you know um wutong or whatever the crappy chinese stuff i'm only saying crappy because i hate the way it feels it's light and powdery but you know these people same people will argue for hours about you know the effect of tiny little things and they will insist that they have a huge impact on the tone and so on and so on. To, to see them trying to ridicule somebody whose lived experience was vast and far greater than their own. And yet they, their dogma was so strong. Gosh, the dogma is strong with these. Um, yeah, they just rubbished it. Anyway, so now we're at a good place because we have the action is set here. It doesn't matter, by the way, if you took the bridge off and somebody turned the wheels. The nice thing is I can go right back to that action and I know the frets now are complicit or no, compliant. Complicit? Compliant. Um, there is a tiny little chip off the front of this nut, but it's so small it's not going to be a, a problem. It's, it's kind of, it's in the manner of a quarter of a millimetre sort of difference. So I'm going to not worry about it. Um, natural material. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this off camera while I also remove these strings, is to take this off and polish it out with a series of um, different grades of sandpaper and some micro mesh. And I'll rejoin you when it's time to um, put new strings on and we'll be in the, the home stretch then. Welcome back. Oh, we're in the restringing mode. So leveled the frets, polished them out. Um, cleaned up, I leveled the frets, reprofiled them, polished them out, now restringing. So this is the fun part. It's about half an hour of sandpapering and polishing that goes on, which I almost these days never rarely put on video because it's just noisy and sweat inducing. Um, but anyway, so I've got some rotor sound tens going on here. Um, I'm putting tens on the Les Paul and on Peter's other two guitars. Um, I'm putting nines, they're both Fender style guitars, squares, I should say. 
So, um, so the next, the nice part, like I say, is that even if the um, the adjustment, the height adjustment down here has been altered, um, we we've, we've basically levelled the frets on this guitar to accommodate the lowest possible action with these with the all you know, set up for a 10 gauge set of strings. So the nice thing is, is as long as we put this back to where it was, um, gonna, but as long as we put the same ga uh, gauge of strings on, we can just go straight back to where it was and it, it, it does that very accommodatingly. So I'm just putting the um, plus rod cover back in on. We don't need any adjustments right now. Um, so yeah, once we strung this up, it should, it will return to the action. If, if somebody, you know, if I'd moved the bridge position, then I can just go and dial in the action I want. And the basically the frets are ready, ready um, leveled for that action. So it's just a matter of, you know, I can go straight to the action I want without any further adjustments or messing around. And I can be confident that it will return to that bar, um, you know, barring or excluding maybe moving countries and going to a completely humid rainforest or some other extreme different environment from where we started and but so yeah it's a very nice way of doing it because it's all pretty much done from the from the beginning well you know we set it all early and then it's it's it'll accommodate this action all the time right so so once you restring then Remember at the beginning, I pulled some slack out of these strings. Now I presume, I, mean, I can assume that maybe they weren't very old anyway. But the point about strings is that it will hold slack in them for an incredible length of time that you just wouldn't expect, and it it will not shed that slack, that stored slack, on its own. Um, it will shed it when you bend strings or when you use a tremolo. Or when you hit the strings hard, or you, you know bend high notes or whatever. But if you, and when it does that, when it does those things, it will go out of tune, because the, the going out of tune is uh, is your slack releasing basically. Um, so if you want your guitar to play in tune, there are two principal things you've got to do. First one is to make a a, a point. If I can find my pliers, make a concerted effort to um, release all the slack from your strings. I've lost my clipper. It's where they gone. Uh, right, they've fallen down somewhere, and I've lost track of them. That's not there. Where are my clippers, my pliers, my snippers? Not that. Not, there they are, staring me in the face. Anyway, um. Yeah, so the, the first one is to is to forcefully, forcibly remove all the slack that exists in the strings. And there's a lot of it, and you have to do it consciously, and it takes 20 minutes to half an hour if you really want to get rid of it. The second thing, along with that, is to ensure that the nut slots are properly cut, and there's enough, they're not gripping the strings. Um, so, for example, we've just put the strings on now. First thing I'm going to do is literally just sort of pull them once or twice to ensure they're in they're kind of fixed in place so there's nothing caught at the back there or they're not hanging up on the, the knotted bits of the uh, twined up bits of the string quite often it's very common with um, strap style guitars because they, they were, the string will catch the ball will catch the back of the tremolo block first positive sign in all of that was that tuning that up there I didn't hear a single ping from the non lubricated slots so the idea is that we've got those running without need for lubrication so now I'm physically going to stretch the strings I'm pressing really hard but I'm not putting stress on the anchor points the pivot points I'm, I'm doing stretching between carefully held 
bits of string between thumb and forefinger and, and pushing that way to get the slack out. Now there's going to be some slack on this side too which you could take care of if you want to and then beyond the nut as well. I mean it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to hoik out but you can do it. Um, but the idea is to push and manually stretch these strings. Now what will happen is you'll hear just how much detuning this has caused and um, obviously you, you if you didn't do this manually that would wait its bide its time and every time you hit a high note to bend it it would uh, it would go out of tune. I'm gonna use this little tuner now it's probably easier but it's annoyingly crap. <laughs> it's only about four quid. Now very often you will break a string while stretching the slack out. It's 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 a par for the course or something. A strange golfing expression. Par for the course. It's what you expect, right? Um, yeah, it's common. So I, I usually have actually I'm a bit low on them because nobody's selling them in the individual packs. They're selling the stupid three pack strings with the strap in it, and I every single strap I get I throw away. They're awful. I wish I could give them to charity or do something or even make a home out of them or anything useful, but they are garbage and they creak. Aha, hear that ping? D string. I'm even just going to write this down. D string is pinging. That means the D string needs widening just a fraction. Now I'll do that now before I go any further. But so what I tend to use is a little bit of 600 grit. Could be a bit rougher. I'm always on the conservative side. Lift that away and I tend to, on the D string, I'll probably double up the uh, Double up the paper, fold it around the blade, careful not to chop the fingers off, and I'll go into the slot and I'll just aim really to push sideways a bit more than downwards. And my aim is to just widen it if I can. Now when when you've got the slot right, Not only will it stop pinging, and I keep I don't guarantee on the first shoot that it'll have cured it, um, but it will stop pinging. And what you'll notice is that when you turn the tuner key, providing your tuners aren't the worst kind, in which case you you have some slop in them and it really doesn't help tuning. But providing they're half decent tuners, which most seal tuners are these days, you you'll notice when your slots are running smoothly you'll notice a distinct linear feel to the to the tuning operation meaning that it turns you'll hear the note change directly in line with turning the key it won't be these kind of dead spots and you can see it and hear it okay so no ping from the D that time Okay, so I've done three physical stretchings of the strings using the thumb and forefinger method. And then what I recommend after that is you give it a test play. This is so light. That is, um, that is less than half the action it came here with, which is quite amazing. So at this point, what I recommend is some gentle pulling. Um, again, you're liable to break the toppy, if anything. 
Um, this is where you'll find a flaw in any of the string manufacturer. If that ball, ball end is going to pop off, it'll do it now. I'm just doing the last few sort of stretches this way. So you notice that barely detuned. There we have it. Beautiful. So um, the other, only other thing I would suggest is do some bends, which I won't do just now, but do some bending and um, that will eke out any further uh, slack that's caught in there. But basically that little bit of sort of manual labour will now pay dividends because this guitar will stay in tune for a whole jam session and you'll just be able to pick it up, tune it, tweak it, tweak the tuning once, get on and play and you'll be amazed how little it will go out of tune, barely any, um, and it, it'll, re you know, you'll notice it, you'll notice how different that feels from other guitars you may have by the fact that you'll, when the guitar's set up that way, you're more than likely going to find yourself reaching for that guitar over anything else. There's a screw loose about the hoose there, I'm just going to grab, you can't really see it, I'm going to grab hold of the the little screw in here. They do this beautifully that the screw on these pick guards goes through and it basically touches the finish underneath which is a completely dopey design. The only way you could get around that is to basically put a washer on this side of it but it would look terrible as well. Um, so well an alternative is to basically is to literally shave off a millimeter. It's probably already would not be surprised if it's already slightly damaged the finish under there because it's it's just base, basically what it does. Um, it's how it works. So what you could do if you really wanted to avoid further damage, you could take this thing out, which I'm doing here, which is there and there. It's actually quite stiff going through the plastic. Um, Oh look, well, let's do the whole thing when I'm at it. It makes it easy to put it back on in a minute anyway. So we'll take it out and um, just make sure everything's in order. Okay, so that's quite stiff going through the plastic, but it's too long. And it's actually just, it's always a, there's always a paint crack. No, cracks, I don't know if you can see it splintered around that hole. It's possibly a wrong sized screw. Um, this is a bit too large, long, large. So there's one one thing you could do is you could literally um, probably dremel off a bit of that. If you can get it to stay still and level. possibly even file off a bit of that. We hope <laughs> we can. Ah, there you go. And then it moves. <coughs> Can it stay in one place? We should be all right. Stay there. to do all you have to do is just be make sure that it fits back onto the um, thingy it's just it's, it's far longer than it needs to be that's the bottom line okay so it still works on there so you could take more off 
Um, I prefer these guitars without those things on, by the way. By the way, I try to say, everything's got a song. I wish, uh, I wish I'd play a bit of that in our band. Some of the, cl some of the, the classic Chili's numbers. Standing in line to see the show tonight. Right, so, let's see if that, we won't know, but how far have we got? More, more. So this is always a case that you need to, you need to, when you tighten this up, you have to hold it from underneath with a pliers. Or if you get a spanner in there, you might you'd be right, but it's ultimately it's a it's got to be held. There's no simple way. So the secret of getting these on is to line it up first, put it down there. Probably a bit too loose, too tight. I mean, put it in place, line it up to where it looks like the business, and then. Your job is to tighten that up a bit there so it stays in place. Put the first one back in. Yeah, I'd be left, left to split. some of those classic Chili's numbers. Other side, by the way. Oh, brilliant tracks. Okay, so it so should be on easy to line up then and then get it in do it up and then in a moment keeping pressure on it and then once that's done up there then we concentrate on getting that's good that's a clear of the deck Clear of the dog, clear of the deck. And really it's just a matter of gently holding this. We need to put a bit of a tighten on that. And you can hear there's a gap. So it's no longer going to run the risk of scratching. You'd have to hit it quite hard to make it scratch. Put it that way. Okay, so there's one last thing on here to do. And for that I will need the assistance of my tunery whatnots. So let me just check this, check that. I need to bring up the amp and my the amp and my phone set to air, air soft safe mode. Oh, car people probably I'm not next to the thing. Uh, better go in and check the phone for messages. Right, so I need a tuner. I also need my app. Okay, so having done all of that good stuff, we're now in, apart from a bit of sticky handprints on the, uh, on the guitar, which is always the way, um, we're now going to do the intonation. And as always, been careful with the strappings because they never never trust them when it's someone else's guitar you take responsibility for your own but I'm always holding it myself stretching it you can see how that wants to pull off really so okay so now this is the intonation setting bit and may well be spot on from the outset I don't know so we have a clean tone. Ooh, nice. So the, the intonation is about making sure that each individual string has its exact length to match this neck. And because of vagaries in respect of the string thickness and composition, um, each one tends to need a slightly different length. It's only microscopic, so we don't do it by measuring. We set the length by um, watching the harmonics. This amp is falling to bits. Okay, what I'm seeing is... So the 
B is on, and high E seems too short. Now, this is the fun part. They were all too low, so I want to bring them forward. Those three want to come forward. Now, this is the pain in the ass bit with the tunematic bridge. So what you do is you kind of make space, you put your guitar back on there, and you try with the skilledest of hands to make an adjustment using these screws, uh, flathead screw adjusters, which is seriously not the best way in the world to do anything. Because look, you can barely get to them. So they were all slightly flat. So I'm going to bring all three of these closer. And I'm going to make try to make my life a bit easier to begin with by slacking these off. I don't really like to do that much because um, it, it's just, I'm guessing really. Uh, and I also don't want to strain the strings too much. But so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to bring all of these forward a little bit to shorten the string because they were registering as flat on the 12th fret. So here's my here's my effort. I'll do it in two pairs of three I guess. Why not? Now with something like this, um, yeah, we're guessing really. Um, when you, when you, by the way, when you slack the strings off to do something like that, you need to just stretch them again because they do uh, the string, the slack builds up again on the posts, um, the tuner posts. Tiny ping on the A there. Need to do some widening. If I can plug this in while it's in this position. Oh, come on. with those. Um, that's that. Uh, what was I going to do? Oh yes, the D and the A. D and A. D and A. I'm going to do a tiny bit of, a bit more widening. I'm going to use the back end of this. See if I can get a bit more widening going on. Actually quite quite difficult to handle and push sideways at the same time. <laughs> okay. If you are going to do any widening, you've got to make sure you don't do any further lowering that you don't actually intend to. That's just the main thing to watch out for. So you've got to concentrate on kind of going sideways for width, not downwards. Keep the minimum downward pressure as possible. <laughs> okay, so stretch those two again.
nice and linear. There we go, set up. Half the action, um, less than half the action it was. If it's too low uh, for Peter, then he can easily uh, increase it um, fractionally by turning the posts each counterclockwise a very small amount. But it's set up the lowest it can be, which is an ultra low, 1.3-ish on the low E and about one, one on the high E, so it's a very nice low start point for the setup. Okay, so there we have it. Got one more of uh, Peter's to do today, and that's a classified strap, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to go and take a little break for a bit, and I'll see you later.